the focus here will be Terra Bio and some specific points about Cambodia crop mapping and RAMI. So just to give a brief overview about Terra Bio, um, you know, this uh, Terra Bio is supposed to be, you know, intended to be a tool to evaluate private sector uh, engagement interventions and assess how these investments, these interventions um, are impacting the environment and local biodiversity. So for the pilot, um, I do want to emphasize, you know, we had limited time to produce this pilot. We are looking to how, you know, the farms were converting pasture to shade grown cocoa plantations. So our goal here um, was to map uh, uh, cocoa plantations and they were in SAF systems, uh, just, you know, agroforestry systems. You can see here on the right side, an example of a cocoa plantation shade grown. So a lot of times, you have banana here, the example is banana, you can have other trees too, and then you have the cocoa tree underneath uh, growing in, in shaded areas. Here's a satellite imagery just showing, I think this is uh, specifically from a Terra Bio project, they have the ages here of cocoa. And you can see, you know, the, the you can kind of see some structure here of, you know, tree rows, but a lot of times it just looks like um, regular, regular forest. The pilot study area for this TerraBio pilot yeah, was the, it's a subset of the São Félix do Xingu city in the Brazilian Amazon, roughly 46,000 kilometers squared. And then as pilot products, we are looking to a land use land cover map of the year 2020. And um, we tried, we tested random forests as, as a baseline and then CNN. So like, kind of like, the idea was to move from you know a pixel-based classification to more of an image segmentation with the same reference data. I'm going to talk about the reference data soon. We also had two other products here, the services map and reforestation map, but the focus is the land use and cover map. And I'm not going to talk at all about the biodiversity aspect of it. So for the reference data for this pilot, we had one of the reference uh, reference data, I'm going to only talk about this one because it was the main one. Those were polygons created by local partners. They are in plot uh, scale, meaning that they are uh, farm properties, boundaries that were hand digitized by an interpreter and classified these polygons into different land use and land covers. Um, what they did, they went on the field during this period of time, collected GPS polygons, and then later on, they hand digitized using satellite imagery um, from ASRI base map, Google base map, and then Sentinel-2 uh, from the 2017 to 2018. They collected overall, it's, it's 150 farm properties and they have uh, roughly 1,200 land use and cover polygons. So this is the, the reference data we had available um, at the time for, for, for this pilot. The land use land cover classes they had in this reference data are noted here. You can see there is a lot. Um, cocoa, you know, shaded cocoa is highlighted here because it was our class of interest. The other class of interest was Asher because we want to see the conversion between the two. And um, you can see too, we have we have Silva Pasher, we have agroforest, agriculture, and others here, construction, natural lake, um, all of that. Two main limitations from this uh, from this reference uh, data set that we looked, you know, by looking at the polygons, we saw that some classes were underrepresented, and then some polygons also covered more than one class or did not correspond uh, to its label. With regards to the classification limitation, um, you know, these are like plot data; they're not log log covered, so it's more. Uh, geared toward like pixel based uh, classification. So not ideal for image segmentation because we have plot level and not wall to wall um, patches. This is just to show how some of the classes were underrepresented. This is sorted by total area. So you can see that, you know, bare soil, for example, had 5.35 hectares of total area compared to like pasture had 5,000. So um, you know, it's just how the landscape is and how, you know, the farm properties had these land use and cover polygons available. Um, and you can see some of the average areas of these polygons are really tiny. Like for bare soil, we had 0.49, which is really small. Um, this one natural lake is 0.18. 
agriculture 1.1. So some of them, you know, small, smaller than two hectares, which, you know, for satellite data, you have to start considering, you know, can we map these um, or not? Forests, you know, forest and pasture were the main um, land use and covers of the, of the area. So we have most of the polygons, the, the majority of the area was for these two classes. In Coco, we also did have a good representation because um, these farm properties were targeted because we knew they were growing, um, you know, the, the, the shaded cocoa. These are just some visual examples of this one shows class uh, overlap. This is an example of a polygon that was legal pasture, but you can see here it is covered uh, crop field. The space map here is map, map box, but this is also in Planet Nick V. Uh, we tested for both. We're going to talk about um, we did the, the mapping with Benedict Fee. We'll talk about that later. And then wrong label too. This is like mapped as constructions, but it's like in the middle of a, a pasture line. So we had some issues with the reference data. Um, and then, you know, by looking at all those classes, um, we started to think, how do you distinguish between shaded cocoa and tree cover forest or agroforest, right? They, they kind of look exactly the same. How do we distinguish between civil pasture and pasture? In the Brazilian Amazon, you have a lot of uh, a presence of dirty pastures, pretty much like pastures that kind of get left abandoned for a period of time, and then also secondary forest. So do, should we have a degraded forest class, we started asking all of these questions and seeing like, how can we work with this reference uh, data set? One thing I want to know here, which we found very useful, especially during the validation um, of the land use and cover map, by this, uh, with distinguishing cocoa with, uh, between cocoa and tree cover, uh, we used the UMD tree height, tree height layer, and we thought, you know, it helped a lot but not completely. Um, it helped a lot in terms in the terms of like it's, we could see that um, cocoa in the Brazilian Amazon specifically in this region, uh, the trees don't go over like five meters. And you know, the forest, like the real natural vegetation can go like above 15. So this uh, layer helped a lot in, you know, to distinguish, okay, these trees are very, um, you know, are not as, as uh, high as, as, as these ones. So this is probably um, an agroforest plantation. So it helped with that, with distinguishing between plantation and natural vegetation, but it was too hard, you know, it didn't help with like interpreting if it's cocoa or some other agroforest um, plantations. So I just wanted to highlight that. This is an example, this is a cocoa plantation here on the left side. And you know, the greener, the pixel here, it means the, you know, higher trees. And here is just a, a patch of forest, um, a forest patch, and you can see it's much greener. So this helped with distinguishing between the two. Uh, civil pasture as well was very interesting because um, many pastures did not have any trees standing. They were just, you know, clean pasture lands. Some of them had some sparsely distributed trees, and some of them were the dirty pasture um, that I mentioned. With these, you know, sparsely distributed, how do we tell if they are being used for, like, for plantation, like, for economic purposes or, or not? How do we know they are super pasture or if they are just trees left on the pasture land? So this also made us, you know, question a lot how we should um, deal with the, with this class. We could see, you know, with Mapbox imagery in this case, we could see this was babasu, which is like a specific um, crop, and we knew in this case it was. Uh, it was like for economic purposes because, um, you know, it's a palm tree they use for, for that. But sometimes it's really hard. You cannot even tell if it's a palm tree or not. So these types of questions. Um, although, and however, uh, because, you know, we, we had all those land use and cover classes in our reference uh, data set, but we actually, um, we were aiming for these uh, classes as the map output. You know, it, it's uh, fewer uh, classes here. We have bushland, pasture, roads, cocoa, tree cover, developed water and agriculture. Cocoa, again, highlighted because it's our class of interest. And this is actual, you know, the output um, we got. So how do we go about um, changing, you know, the labels we have in the reference data set to the map output we want to have? Um, we kept bushland as it is. 
for pasture, we kind of incorporated silver pasture into pasture, although with this caveat that sometimes we have sparsely distributed trees that could cause confusion with tree cover and all of that. Roads, we noticed that the bare soil class of the reference data were mainly roads. I put here two images just to show. So we kind of called that class roads instead of bare soil. Cocoa was kept the same. And then tree cover, we kind of had to uh, encompass forests, agroforests, and home garden as well. We had some, you know, in some pasturelands, we have the house there with some trees around. We consider that home garden trees. So that was all incorporated in the tree cover class. Um, this, you know, we knew like differentiating between agroforests and forests was going to be really hard anyway. So why not, you know, put them together? to at least try to distinguish between cocoa and tree cover in general. And then developed it. We had in the reference data constructions and mining, we consider everything developed. And then natural lakes, we had was considered water, just water bodies. And we had agriculture as well, which are non-cocoa plantations, and they're not like shaded grown or anything, just regular um, agriculture crop types. And then we started, you know, later, I'll talk about this later in the survey um, for the validation. We kind of considered these classes like forests, agroforests as like subclasses. They are kind of land uses of this main land cover class. We kind of use this approach to see, you know, what, what happened, where is the confusion going on, if you can take anything out of this. Um, we also collected additional Polygons, one, because as I said, we had on the representation so far, like water, roads, and agriculture, we collected more polygons. And we also collect for cocoa because it is the class of interest, the more the merrier. So we collected some other um, cocoa uh, polygons as well. And then um, for this, we used Bionic Fee 2020 monthly mosaics. And, you know, that reference data that I mentioned. Uh, they did not use planning fee, so that kind of led into discrepancy, uh, you know, geolocation. And we also didn't know at the time, um, timestamps of those existing polygons. So, you know, here the point is, you know, documentation is important. Like, we have to take note about, you know, the month and year of when you um, label that polygon, which base map you use, and all of that. Um, I'm going to talk about why we use planning fee later. But we noticed like some of these issues. And then um, the other issue we had, you know, I mentioned for some of the polygons, they are covering more than one class. We tried to correct them. And this was a great exercise because um, we kind of failed, but then we learned. And <laughs> it's a you know great learning point for us here. Um, the thing is, uh, we uploaded some of these polygons that needed correction into CEO as uh, polygons, as plots, sorry, instead of samples. So this way, it's kind of hard to see, you know, what's around since we had the plot, um, the plot level data. Um, when you upload polygons individually, you cannot see the polygons uh, adjacent to them. So when we were correcting some of the polygons, in the end, some of them were overlapping with each other, as you can see here um, at the bottom here. Um, this was an issue because we had overlapping polygons. So this is not good. And the other issue, too, is uh, we had gaps in the, inside the, the farm um, property. So like for image segmentation, for example, we need a wall to all covered. So having gaps is not um, really useful. Here's another example. Um, just showing the original image and the label, uh, mass the masked image with the labels, and you can see for some of them didn't correspond entirely. Um, so this was a great exercise uh, for us to learn, um, you know, how not to do this, and now we have a better idea how to do this. And then after you know correcting um, some of polygons uh, and uh, collecting. Uh, yeah, collecting additional and correcting some polygons. Um, we did test, we, you know, we ran, um, we used Planetic Fee, which was resampled to 20 meters. Send out to imagery, Alice files are to SRTM and the Google Forest Change layer by Hansen et al. Um, as input to the model, we took the polygons and converted to 20 meter spaced points. 
we excluded ambiguous information, meaning that like that those overlapping polygons, uh, they were exclu excluded from the from the reference data set. And then we ran both random forests as a baseline in a CNN um, per classification. This is just showing how you know the, the points were spaced um, inside a polygon. For the validation, after we got results, um, we did a mapathon using Collect Earth Online, and we estimated um, using you know all of, uh, all of some et al's uh, formulas and all, all of that. 1,700 points we needed uh, for validation. And we had a team of analysts for interpretation of these sample points. And this was extremely important to have, you know, more than one person doing this, having, you know, we had like five or six people is a great time saver for us. And while we were, you know, uh, getting together to decide how this is gonna be, we had rich discussions regarding definitions of classes. And this uh, really improved the consistency, consistency of the team's interpretation. We developed interpretation key. This is something I'm going to talk um, later, which really helped. You know, we, we have to assure that the way I interpret a cocoa plantation is the same as someone else is going to interpret a cocoa plantation. So, you know, we had also CEO project tasks to assure that we are all agreeing on a land cover um, or land use. So, like on CEO, we had trial, like project trials to make sure everyone was in agreement and every instruction was clear enough that we could all get to the to the end goal regarding um qa qc um ideally with enough time allotted which we didn't have at the time you know multiple analysts like different people would interpret the same samples to assure consistency we didn't have not we didn't have time to do that so what we did we added this like bot confidence feature in ceo and we asked them to rate you know how confident you are of classifying this this bot and you know, whenever we saw, we would meet like every day. Whenever we saw a low confidence spot, we were we would review this spot together as a team and get to the to the final answer. So this was our way to do uh, QA QC. I'm sorry, I think there's construction going on. I'm not sure. Um, and then a survey question for notes was really helpful too, because you know they could write, oh, I think I'm I'm I you know my confidence is 60% because, you know, because of these reasons. So have, having this in CEO set up a note session was really helpful to you for the discussion the next day. These are some of, these are the results for the random forest. Um, I'm not showing the results for the CNN, but it was a little less here, you know, in terms of overall accuracy than random forest. You can see overall accuracy, we had 75%. And with regards to the classes, we can see like cocoa, which is you know the main class of interest. We had you know very poor results here um, for like tree cover, like forest. So, you know we had higher accuracies, which was you know expected, and water as well. But you can see overall, it's you know it's not doing pretty well. Um, the model, the forest model. So we jump into lessons learned. Like after we did all of this, um, you know what went wrong you know, through the process, the issues we encountered, all of that. Um, here, this presentation, um, I think Tim is going to share later, but if you click here, this is straight from the development seed report. A lot of this that I'm talking here is from them. We had, you know, their SME work and it really helped us identify some pain points and how to improve. Um, one thing here to start off, and if you click here, it's going to take you to that link, to that report. Um, you know, class, you know, the label agreement and description should be decided before the mapping process, but considering methods imagery available. In our, in our case, like we had the reference data before we could talk about, um, you know, imagery available and map output. So that in this case, in this particular case was a little bit of a, of a bottleneck, but um, this should be done in every project, I believe, you know, development of interpretation key where you have description and examples, like visual examples of every single class uh, in your land typology. Also, um, land expertise is crucial. Like in our case, we had someone that had been in the in San Felix do Xingu, you know, that was really helpful in identifying cocoa fields when we were like, oh, I'm not sure if this is cocoa field or if it's just nat natural uh, forest patch. He would help us with that. So this is really, really extremely helpful, not only like for interpreting, for you know, digitizing or interpreting a plot, 
would also like to develop the interpretation key. Rule of thumb here, I think most of you know, um, if a human can distinguish between classes, the mo model probably won. You know, if you only have one source of imagery, the model probably won. Um, we learned that, um, you know, like because Coco and Agroforest and Trick over there are very similar. So how do we do that, right? And then um, it's always good to start mapping broader classes. So like agroforestry in general, then refine, then go like to Coco and your specific um, types of, of, of agroforestry crops. And then you should also consider the size of cocoa fields. Many of our fields were less than two hectares. So like how, how, how can, which satellite imagery can we use to help us with that? Do we have you know, the, the spatial resolution needed? Timestamp, month and year at a minimum of reference data has to be recorded and be consistent. So we saw that label and imagery mismatch will induce uh, model errors. So for like, uh, for terabyte action items now, we're starting a new uh, phase now. We will, you know, reconsider the classification schema to fit the constraints of the available imagery. You know, we've been using Planet Phi because it's higher resolution, uh, but can we still distinguish agroforest from cocoa from tree cover? So like talking about this, this uh, seeing if, you know, what's the best way here to, to, to find our class schema? Should we go broader? Should we change the class? Uh, those type of conversation. And then fix or recreate the reference data set that we have that we have to resolve the temporal inconsistencies and geometric mismatch. So now, like in this new phase, we're gonna have a you know, make sure that this new reference data set um, will have you know the timestamp of you know of when the it was labeled, which base map, which imagery it was used, and all of that. These next slides are gonna have a lot of text. Uh, bear with me, but I think they're gonna be very important. Here are just some imagery source guidance. I think you know all of you know this, but you know try to follow this when you're choosing the imagery uh, to use. Spatial coverage, uh, you know, is the flight path of the sensor going to cross that area? Temporal, uh, is there imagery for the time of interest with respect to the AOI? Um, you should think about are you going to use uh, monthly mosaics, just individual images, uh, mosaics, all of that. Spatial, this is, you know, spatial res resolution orientation of the sensor suitable enough for an adaptator to consistently distinguish the class of interest. Again, the cocoa example, like, can we distinguish cocoa from regular tree cover, just looking at a planet imagery or not? Spectral, you know, the bands, the wavelengths, uh, do we have hyperspectral data? Does that help with uh, distinguishing some of the classes? Cost, we you know here we are using like planet NIC fee, but, you know, in terms of sustainability, is that going to be available, you know, moving forward? Do we need to, you know, have a backup plan? Any cloud coverage, like we are this one, we are working in the Brazilian Amazon, so we do have a lot of cloud coverage. How is that going to impact if we use individual images? Probably not a good idea, but mosaics, probably that works, you know, just keep that in mind. And then, yeah, consider, again, this class schema, uh, definition like consider that at the start of the workflow conception especially before any large scale annotation efforts come in so um in our case uh we we didn't discuss this before we got the reference data from the local uh from the local partners and you know we, we kind of ran into this those issues that i mentioned um so yeah again like we, Probably what a human cannot see with their, you know, their bare eyes, a machine will, will, won't be able to see either. So uh, make sure, yeah, you have descriptive feature uh, representations in the imagery that can distinguish the classes. And if you don't have that, you can, you know, at least feed other types of, you know, imagery, other types of information that the machine might be able to decipher, such as other wavelengths, spectral indices, and radar. And then I think this is a very important um, question. We consider first in the workflow planning, should we identify the classes first and then, uh, and then you know, look for appropriate imagery or should we choose the imagery first and then nail down the classes? And you know, the answer is that they should both be done in, in parallel. Um, 
the choice of the, the imagery should be done uh, jointly with a realistic lens for what is available and feasible given the time constraints. So uh, I think you have to, you know, it's a trade-off. You have to balance both sides to see what's best for your goals and for the time you have available. Now regarding label formation and annotation campaign, um, the imagery used for modeling is the imagery used for labeling. So that should be consistent and the annotator should have access to all imagery and all information made available to the model. So they, you know, the model and the people, the annotator should have the same information. Every single label should be associated with a timestamp, talking about this again, especially if you're working with time series data, if you're using RNN, for example, you know, you have to make note of timestamp if you're looking to phenology for crop mapping and all of that. Um, the classes chosen should be those that are identified as well represented in the imagery and that are relevant to the modeling objective. Again, talking about how to choose the class schema. And then this is something, it was more um, for Rami. If we have extraneous or peripheral classes, they may be uh, included into a background class. Um, in this case, it's, you know, you do that when they are rare or when they are not of interest. However, um, if we see that, you know, this class begins to confuse with the class of interest, then uh, we should, you know, it might be worth annotating this class. The, the example here is agroforestry um, and forest. Like forest might not be a class of interest, but because it confuses a lot of cocoa and agroforest, we might as well um, annotate this class. For Rami, I'm gonna talk later, we saw that, you know, forest was really not of interest. Um, so that was decided to be a background class. More on label formation and annotation campaign. Labels should not conflict with each other. I think you all know this as well, like having a class river and water body, water body can cause confusion. We shouldn't have redundant, redundant classes, so like buildings and developed, they're you know, very redundant. redundant. And um, we should really focus the annotation campaign on mapping foreground classes. Uh, you know, the background classes is a waste of time to manually map and they can uh, be automatically rasterized. It's easier um, when you have background class to rasterize them. And the label should be comprehensive. So, you know, if you started mapping um, forests, labeling forests, you should label forests in the entire AOI. You shouldn't just, you know, map half of it and leave half of it out. Um, choosing a feasible pilot study area when creating your data set. So, you know, make sure you have time to finish your annotation campaign and not like leave half of, you know, partial coverage or anything like that. So keep in mind the time constraint for that. And then labeling policy should be consistent. Again, having uh, guidelines, instructions on how to annotate. Uh, the example here is shadow. Like if you see a shadow inside of your, you know, um, uh, a class you have, do you draw around it or do you include in the class? So having these policies, uh, you know, clear for everyone that is going to be working the annotation campaign. And then adjacent polygons edges should be snapped together. Um, this is what we saw there where we had some gaps uh, between in between the polygons. So make sure there are no gaps in between the polygons. Make sure, you know, especially for image segmentation, um, they should be snapped together. For sampling strategy, um, this is was mainly for Rami, but um, you know, just a simple random sampling of tiles within our area of interest is most most likely not the correct approach because we need to do strategic selection. We need to make sure that our AOI is going to get have a good representation of all the classes we have, special classes of interest. Um, we should intentionally sample hard negatives, meaning you know the classes that look like a, the class of interest. They can either be assigned to a background class, as I mentioned, or have a separate class just for them if you have time um, to do that. And then we also should always have a small percentage of pure background image tiles. Um, you know, like in the case of Rami, we had you know forest as a background class, so we. You know, the idea is to make sure we include some tiles that only are forest or only include forest in another background class. So the model doesn't think that target classes are always present. 
and here I just added the link, um, you know, to the link to the report is here on their logo. But you, I also have the link here, which brings to the to the uh, Jupyter notebook where they have a, a lesson on dealing with limited data for semantic segmentation. Another thing I wanted to point out, they do talk about you know the Java OpenStreetMap editor for annotation campaigns. I particularly have never used this. I you know didn't know this was a thing, but you know, it's, it's good to see that there are other tools out there. Um, you know, we, we focus I hear we talked a lot about quite earth online, but it's good to see that we can check other tools too. And this is it for uh, Terra Bio. Um, I do have a couple more slides, not as long as, as Terra Bio for Cambodia. Um, should I keep just going? I know it's been a long time already. Any questions so far? Andre, I say keep going. Cool. Okay. So for Cambodia, uh, we had the Department of Agriculture and Resources Management looking to improve the level of crop commodity information for their uh, greenhouse gases inventory. They currently map crop commodities by hand, so they only, you know, they're with that they only able to do one province per year. The goal then of this project is to produce annual national maps of crop commodities. So we want annual information for the entire Cambodia on crop commodities. And you know, during the project, um, the priority for you know this year is cashew, mango, cassava, and maize. Here you can see this is the land typology. We have these classes were discussed with them, and this is how um, you know they decided they want to have you know, their classes. So we have perennial crops that divide into palm crops, sugar crops, and barley two crops, and they own their own crop types within. We also have annual crops and then other, which is all the other land use and forward. So you can see there's a lot of information here, a lot of classes and subclasses um, in their land typology. The first phase with them, we have then um, worked in the hand digitization of 12 4 by 4 kilometer patches in the district of Rotonac, Mondal, and they use QGIS mailing. So, you know, in the entire country of Cambodia, they focus on this green area here, and they digitize 12 4 by 4 kilometer patches, like wall to wall coverage um, of whatever was, you know, beneath it, the land use and cover there. For that, they use all of these uh, satellite imagery sources, uh, different sensors here. And then there are a lot of like issues identifying during this data collection. When using like Landsat and Sentinel, they saw, you know, it's very, use, very difficult to identify palm oil, looks similar to rubber, difficult to assign the type of fruit tree while we're young, especially for mango, cashew, etc. It's difficult to assign crop type in medium resolution imagery. You can, you know, you can see the boundary, the area of that crop, the 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 crop, the farm, but not the crop type. Difficult, difficult to digitize sam samples of into cropping when you have more than one crop in, in in a farm. Like, how do you can can you can you identify which one is the main one? A database on seasonal crop, like a agriculture calendar, um, would be helpful. Some areas were not clear, did not, did not have up-to-date satellite images, sometimes couldn't be recognized well, mango and cashew. And yeah, I can identify annual crop areas, but not specific crops due to crop, crop rotation. So you have you know, all of these issues that we identified in the, this first phase of data collection using satellite imagery. So I'm not going in the field at all uh, and say, okay, so what can we do about all of these issues? But we did, with that data, um, we did run FCNN using Sigmoid as activation function. We tested with Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 images. The best model results with, you know, within this first phase trial were with Sentinel-1 images only. You can see, you know, 84 accuracy, but precision and recall are, you know, not so good. And then, but then we noticed that the source of misclassification was again, you know, similar to terabyte quality of training data. So lots of areas that aided as orchards. We are trying just for orchards, so only for broadleaf tree crop in this case. Only if the the you know is it broadleaf tree crop or not. Binary started broad, 
uh, you know, some of the problems did not follow good practices. Um, newly planted areas, we saw that there was an issue and they did not show up in the model as was expected. And then, you know, the conclusion, mid resolutions might not be adequate for this classification problem. So move to planning fee, with, you know, higher resolution. Then, you know, with this, with all the issues we saw here of how difficult it is to identify these crop types and satellite imagery, um, we saw how field campaigns are really important for collecting data. The second phase we worked with, you know, data correction, similarly to TerraBio, um, you know, these projects, projects were happening at the same time. We tried to correct some of the polygons and we also went to acquire additional um, data in CEO. There are links here for instructions. Um, again, we see that, you know, some of the polygons were, you know, did not follow good practice. So we see the importance of having clear instructions uh, for people, for the annotators uh, to follow guidelines. Um, again, the same issue of TerraBio, um, you know, the, the, you know, data correction introduce new geometric artifacts because we didn't have surrounding polygons. Um, so that, you know, same issue, some overlapping polygons, some gaps and all of that. So we need to update instructions um, for that. This is just, you know, this is, was the questions from the CEO project where they were correcting um, the polygon boundaries. Just uh, example of questions. If the boundary was incorrect, they would do proactive sampling and fix that. And then they would also reconfirm if, if the label for the crop type was right or not. The data collection, um, we did again four by four kilometer patches, but this time we broke in them down into one by one kilometer patch. I don't know if you've seen a plot of a four by four kilometer patch in CEO, but it's pretty huge. Uh, and you, you have to spend a lot of time digitizing um, sometimes you have to, you know, stop the, in the middle of it and sometimes you lose your work and that's why we broke it down into one by one kilometer so they could save it faster. Um, but, you know, in the end, this was kind of generated an issue because, um, you know, when you group them together, these one by one kilometer into the full four by four, we saw that some of the boundaries did not, you know, uh, snap together. So we had gaps there. That's because, you know, CEO, CEO does a great job that, you know, it, it snaps the vertices of polygons, but it does not snap the vertices of a, of a plot. So we had that issue there. And for this data collection, we also decided to collect only, you know, the broader class label instead of the specific crop type, because for time purposes, we did that. But in the end, like afterwards, we thought, okay, maybe this is, wasn't a very good idea. So, you know, another learning point for us, I think even if you collect less data, but have the specific tri uh, crop type information might be more useful than collecting more data, but only having um, the broader class uh, label there. We also allowed going over the boundary of the plot, which was not a good idea because, you know, this leads into post processing where you have to clip um, the plot boundary from your polygon boundary. So I'm not a lot of learning points here um, as well. So for second phase, we, you know, focus more, we kept doing like CEO data collection, but we also focus on reference uh, field data collection. You know, the Cambodia team had the opportunity to go in the field to collect more data. And what's interesting here, they use carry map. I particularly wasn't aware of this app, but it is a free app where you have, you can see different base maps, it works offline, you can add, you know, different types of features, create points using camera, you know, record GPS data. So uh, this was interesting, it just links here um, for awareness. But they went there and they, you know, uh, did this field campaign in the same district to collect more data because it's, it's easier for them to um, identify a crop type on the field than looking into the satellite imagery. The issue though here is that, you know, the, when they go in the field, they collect these sparsely distributed um, polygons. So there's always the need to, you know, to post process this data in Collect Earth Online to have a wall-to-wall -wall coverage, which is very time consuming. Another issue is that with CarryMap, we couldn't have the planning fee uh, base map added there. 
So, you know, there's a, a misalignment between the planning fee and the base map that they collect uh, the polygons on. So that's another issue we notice. But uh, nevertheless, we also ran, um, you know, a model for binary broadleaf tree crop classification. You know, at the time, the data was still a very small fraction of the country. So we leveraged data from Servir Mekong from Thailand combined with the Cambodia data and ran a model using RGBN channels of planning fee, 120 by 120 patches and mobile net, V2 network. And we saw that the model performs poorly over areas with evergreen forests and flooded forests. There's a lot of confusion um, of these classes. And you know, the, the conclusion is that we didn't have any patches, no uh, training data over those areas. So we need to collect more data, have a better representation of the entire um, area. And we were trying like for different provinces because uh, at you know this time we didn't have a lot of uh, data across the entire country of Cambodia. And then so now for this uh, third phase, we're entering third phase where you know we are proposing some changes for the few data uh, campaign that they do. You know they are very helpful because they can distinguish crop type, but there are some things we uh, should probably uh, consider when doing this. So the first thing is, you know, this, uh, what I mentioned about having sparsely distributed polygons and having concentrated sampling fields. So now for the wall-to-wall -wall coverage, we're, you know, planning to give ahead of time these plots, these four by four plots, so they can focus most of the effort collecting polygons within these plots. So the data is more concentrated um, in an area. You know, the, the Fields that are outside of the patches, the four by four patches, they cannot be used by the machine learning model. So this is, you know, this is showing like three different patches we have, and you know, this polygon here and this red arrow, like we would have to crop to clip this, like you know, so the 2022 proposed distribution, they wouldn't, um, you know, cross this plot boundary. They would just uh, delineate what's was going to be inside the the four by four kilometer patch. The other thing is, you know, they can also, since they are on the field, one way to save time being there, if they can see from where they are standing, like what's, you know, the land use and cover on the side of the field they are mapping, can you include that already? Can you draw a polygon saying, okay, this is a forest patch or this is, you know, a house? Like, can you do that? So this also will save time um, having to do post-processing, uh, you know, in collect earth online to see what's neighboring uh, the fields here of interest. Because when they do these field data collections, they go focusing on the farms they know they have, you know, cashew, mango, cassava, and maize. But can we map as well what's around when you are on the field? So that's another thing we're gonna try to do. And finally, they did not, um, they, whenever they go on the field, they have a field form where they have to fill out, you know, all, the inform all of this information. And one thing that was missing was base map use. So now we're asking them to include this base map use because uh, sometimes, you know, we know when the time, the dating time where they label, they digitize a polygon, but we don't know the imagery used. And sometimes, you know, there's the misalignment we've planned. We need to know this type of information. So this is something we are adding to the field form as well. And then the third phase, uh, we are, yeah, the goal is to collect data on priority crops with the proposed changes. And we are also, you know, in parallel testing different approaches. Uh, this is like an output of a you know, broader class map, not specific crop type. And we are also testing like binary cashew uh, classification. We are testing different approaches while they are um, going on the field. We currently have 4,600 polygons, which is a lot, but you know, for the entire country of Cambodia, uh, we still need more, more polygons. And finally, Rami only has three slides, so, um, and the folks are here, please feel free to add um, if I miss anything. But, you know, the goal of Rami, just quickly, is the detection of illegal gold mining activities in Madrid, the US Peru. Currently uses Sentinel-1 images and the QTAS algorithm, but, you know, it, it was yielding, there are some false positives in their results, so, uh, I think the goal is, you know, test using a CNN to see, you know, if the results are better, do we have the same number of false positives or not? 
And then for the data collection, we also decided to do four by four kilometer patches. And, you know, at this time we said, okay, we're only going to collect using planning fee mosaic of, you know, August of 2021. And we learned about all the stuff that happened in Terabio in, in like Cambodia. And we said we need specific timestamp and use the imagery that we are going to use to model. So we decided to use, um, we decided to have these classes in our image segmentation. And then, you know, in the end, we actually decided not to have the forest as a class because it's easy to, to, to classify, it's easy, easy to, to model. And it's, it's uh, so we decided to, to eliminate the class here of interest is mining. So you can see here, there's an example of a patch where, you know, it's wall to wall coverage and, you know, we're covering all of these classes with individual polygons here of these classes. The main issue though, this is also a great learning point for us. We are using Clyde Earth Online to do this wall to wall coverage, but currently CEO doesn't have the ability to sample rings. What I mean by that is, you know, sometimes here in this example, this orange polygon here is like mapping all the sandbars, which is one of our classes. But we do have like a forest patch here in the middle of our sandbar. Currently, we cannot like have a, a class within a class, like a polygon within a polygon with CEO. So we can do two things, uh, which leads to, you know, do two things outside of CEO, so post-processing there. We can create two polygons that overlap and we can clip them later. Or we can sample and have this line, which is the line that, you know, connects um, the polygons uh, at the end because, you know, we cannot, we cannot have uh, two different polygons inside each, each other. So this is an issue that we found out, like, as we were doing this, um, it was also a great learning point um, for us, like, on doing wall-to-wall -wall coverage. So we're assessing how feasible it is to have a feature where we can maybe clip this or have a ring, you know, we can draw rings um, within collector for line. And that's it. Just final slides here. Overall lessons learned. Lens topology and satellite imagery to be used should be discussed ahead of time. The size of target classes matter, as we've seen like with cocoa fields uh, less than two hectares. How do we go about that? We should always have descriptive details of each class, have interpretation keys, have agreement between annotators. Uh, discussion about broader and specific classes uh, was really, you know, useful. We should always, if we have time, start with broader classes and refine to specific class. Um, that seems to pay off in the end. Wall to wall coverage in a concentrated area might be the best approach as long as all classes are captured in that area. So, you know, choosing the right AOI for testing, good distribution of classes and class variability should be in your AOI representation of target classes and then scale matters. Yeah, I always start small and then scale up. Like with Cambodia, for example, now it's kind of, you know, trying to make sure that in one province, in one province works and then scale that up. And then mapathons, reference data collection companies are very time consuming. We started, you know, questioning ourselves. Is there a shortcut? You know, the Cambodia team asked, can we do a segmentation? We, do we have anything that we can delineate crops uh, automatically and then we can label them. So we started digging to, you know, reading papers that talk about feed, uh, crop feed delineation to see if we could do something about that. So just uh, these links here. And then very important to have well-trained interpreters and clear instructions. Um, these are of paramount importance. And, you know, in the end, data collection is the most important step of image segmentation process. So that's it.